Good morning and welcome to Skyline Software Systems Virtual Trade Show webinar series. Today we are bringing you our third and final part, exploring the Blue Sky Skyline Partnership, the amazing 3D models it produces and their uses and applications. We have Blue Sky's George Day and Skyline's Dave Lozier and Itai Schechter with us today to break it all down for us. We're aiming for about 20 to 25 minutes of content with time for questions at the end. Please type any questions you have in the questions area in your GoToWebinar dashboard and they will be answered at the end. Also in your GoToWebinar dashboard is a section titled Handouts. We have a case study for you and you can find it there in that section. Everyone who registered for this webinar will receive an email containing a link to a recording of it. So look for it in your inbox later today. So let's get started. Dave, George, Itai, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. I will go ahead and turn it over to you guys now. Good morning and afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is George Day and I'm the sales manager with Blue Sky. I'm going to take you through how Blue Sky have been working with Skyline and some of the market sectors that we have been finding success with, uh, with our mesh models and the sensor we are using to capture the data for the mesh models. As you can see, our primary role um, with the Blue Sky Skyline partnership is data acquisition. We are using the Light City Mapper to simultaneously capture Nadir imagery, oblique imagery, as well as LiDAR data. We're processing this through to Orthos, Obliques, and LiDAR, DSM, and DTMs, as well as passing this data onto Skyline to create the mesh models. As you can see, we are offering this through a, a range of different channels, as well as licensing options to make the models easily accessible, no matter how big or small the project. Today, I'm going to take you through a, a few of the applications we've been finding um, real use for these models, where they come into their own, and a few of the different market sectors. Starting with the insurance sector, uh, it's at a pivotal point and is starting to embrace the explosion of intelligent data suddenly available. The exciting thing about applying data of this type to insurance is that relatively small cost data collection exercises could result in huge savings across massive portfolios of customers. The key challenge for the insurance market is integration and proof of secure investment from purse string holders. Sadly, we live in an increasingly dangerous world where our urban areas are susceptible to a particular threat. The security services have been using oblique aerial imagery for many years to assess operational situations and plan either preemptive or reactive operations. The advantages of being able to view the facades of buildings and take measurements are obvious. Where might threats come from and where should assets be deployed? An interactive 3D mesh model takes this number of steps forward. A dynamic 3D environment provides continuity, context, accuracy, and flexibility. We've also seen a huge uptake in the city planning market. The planning and the urban development discipline was one of the earliest adapters to the GIS and are often the most forward thinking when it comes to adopting new innovations in the GI industry. I imagine everyone here that's listening has heard an awful lot about smart cities, and this is where the city mo mesh model really shines. Built environment is a dynamic man-made ecosystem that needs to be carefully managed and planned. Knowing how new developments are going to affect existing structures or communities is a vital part of the consent process, and what better way to illustrate this to key stakeholders then providing a 3D representation and using dynamic modeling tools to represent right to light issues, light of sight concerns, traffic pressures, and simple aesthetics. 5G is a, a buzzword that's probably more around than ever um, with the current situation of the world. It promises some very exciting advancements that will make some, the smart city in its truest sense a reality. But there is a long way to go to ensure 5G is efficiently enabled and there are a complex set of variables that can that the network enablers have to investigate and assess before beginning to plan a robust 5G network. Traditional accurate line of sight and view shed analysis are the still integral part of a puzzle. However, the wavelengths involved in 5G mean that other features like building materials, vegetation type and other man-made obstructions need to be taken into account. An accurate textured mesh provides much of this detail in one model.
as you can see from the clip in any visualization project, we can easily optimize any project from the very origin of a project to the impacts of changes to a site that can be modeled. Individual buildings can be entirely flattened and new proposed designs uploaded into the model to assess how they truly sit within the surrounding context. One des designs or a refined model can be used throughout the entire planning process and provide a powerful tool for public consultation. <clears throat> now that was a brief uh, explanation on the applications that we've been using and finding the mesh models come into their own. I briefly wanted to discuss the city mapper, which is the sensor we've been using to capture the data. The sensor we're using is a groundbreaking instrument which captures vertical and oblique imagery as well as LiDAR data. <coughs> Excuse me. We create this um, uniquely co registered data set from capturing three forms of data all at the same time. We took the decision to upgrade the LiDAR unit within the sensor for our Metro Vista program so that we could capture high density LiDAR uh, at an efficient pace. Over cities that we've planned so far, we're capturing anywhere between six to 10 points per meter, although the, the unit is capable of getting upwards of 40 points per meter, dependent on terrain. We plan to capture most urban areas throughout the UK. And again, we'll be looking at capturing anywhere between three and seven centimeter resolution. From this data, we're going to be passing it on to Skyline to create mesh models. I'll now pass over to Itai, who's going to take us through photo mesh, I believe. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, George. Um, so uh, the software the Skyline uses, which is our own proprietary software, we've developed for uh, very advanced photogrammetric applications. And uh, it utilizes parallel processing, so it's able to run on uh, hundreds of machines in parallel computers. Um, we call it the Fuser technology, and it generates any sort of 3D output. Um, and I'll take over the screen and, and show you um, what it looks like. Here we go. So this is the PhotoMesh interface. Um, you can see it's inside a real world location. So we're in England, right around the Thames River. This is uh, the, one of the projects that we processed from the Blue Sky Leica City Mapper data. Um, so the icons that you're seeing here is the five cameras. Uh, there's a nadir camera and then the four obliques, like George was explaining. Um, and the square boxes that you're seeing are the uh, LiDAR tiles. Um, now, we have the ability to import the LiDAR uh, and the imagery, the information. Everything is properly referenced into the world. So whatever coordinate system, uh, projection, or a vertical datum it is, um, could be utilized, including the British one, ordnance datum. Um, so uh, we bring the, the data into PhotoMesh, and then as part of uh, co-registering and making sure all the data is properly aligned, uh, we can view the LiDAR in PhotoMesh. Um, in this case, just pick some points to verify that uh, the data is perfectly co-registered on pretty much the pixel level. Um, so you see this is one of the markings in the road um, that is visible in the LiDAR. And we can then sample it inside the images in order to make sure that um, the nadirs, the obliques, uh, all are sampled on the same exact feature. This only needs to be done several times uh, at several points on, on a relatively large project. Um, and then it's able to use that to produce a very low sampling error and geographic error. Uh, so you can see these are some of the nadir images. Um, here are some of the oblique images that are sampled in there. Um, and they're all pretty much co-registered on the pixel level with the same feature that was sampled in the LiDAR. Um, just to 
addressing some questions as they come up. The, the software is not open source. It is owned by Skyline and is a proprietary tool. Um, it's very powerful use software for processing. Um, so once the data is uh, processed through the AT, uh, we are able to split the entire project up into reconstruction tiles and each computer can process an individual tile. So it, even if you have thousands of tiles, if you process them on 100 computers or more, you're working in batches of um, hundreds of tiles at once. Uh, now, each one of the tiles goes through a very rigorous point cloud extraction process. You can see the, the dense point cloud. Um, and then the, the geometric model, which is uh, the basically the mesh, the geometric mesh. And then we texture that mesh. Um, and by the way, this is already a combination of both the LIDAR points and the imagery points. You see, this is what a single tile looks like. And um, at the end of the process, we could combine all of the, the tiles together. So you can see this is just a couple of the tiles. They all seamlessly integrate together and produce one single output, um, including you see where the LIDAR is really helpful with very thin features and sort of getting in between uh, tight structures. Um, and then at the end of the process, uh, if we produce really any given format that is necessary from a 3D mesh, um, including uh, standard formats such as SLPK or cesium or OSGB. We also produce a true ortho and the dense point cloud. Um, and addressing some of the questions that are coming up, uh, the best way to create 3D mesh models with photo or LIDAR points, uh, well, to create a textured mesh, you need imagery. That's where the texture comes from. The LIDAR points are definitely good in enhancing the data. So you can see in areas where there's vegetation, um, which this is a city model, so there isn't a lot of it. Uh, the LIDAR is able to then penetrate vegetation data and uh, reach areas where just images wouldn't be able to. Um, we integrate the image-based point cloud and the LIDAR during the, um, a, during the reconstruction phase, not during the AT. So uh, the image-based point cloud produces uh, a very dense colorized points, and then the LIDAR points are continued um, to enhance the, the mesh with both of them. So this is an example of some area with vegetation. You can see where the LIDAR is able to get underneath, um, and this wouldn't be data that would be available for images only. So. That's part of the advantages of having LIDAR. Um, that and LIDAR only requires a single point in order to get a range where images require at least two rays um, to have a stereo triangle that um, can measure the depth. Um, so that's where LIDAR is able to get more details, especially in urban environments uh, such as dense cities and um, get very fine features um, like you're seeing in this model. Uh, so at this point, I'll turn it back over to Dave, um, and Dave can resume the, showing you some of the applications of using the mesh inside Skyline's uh, visualization and analytical tools that I explore. Okay, could you confirm, me, Tyler, that you can see my screen? There we go. Yes. Okay. Are you seeing my screen, folks? Hey, Ty. Yes. Laura. Great. Okay. What you're seeing now. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name's David Losher. What you're seeing on the screen is Terra Explorer. Terra Explorer is Skyline's 3D GIS package. So it's a bit like a GIS, except everything we do, we do in 3D. But it's like any other GIS package on the left there, you will see all the different data layers along the top, all the different analysis tools that we have. At the moment, I've got loaded um, all of the data sets that we produce with Blue Sky. You can see them at the top here. 
There's about eight of them. Um, that's about uh, 530 gigabytes of data and it covers about 400 square kilometers. If we fly to one of them, say Nottingham, for example, in we go, there it is. You will see the area, it's, uh, I think it's about 20 square kilometers there. And if we zoom in, there are two soccer stadiums there, Nottingham County, Nottingham Forest, just across the river. And in here, I have just a little example of the sort of things we can do. We can do simple measurements on all 3D objects. So we measure the height of the building there. We can measure the slope area of the roof. And we can do a simple linear measurement along the ground. Um, if we now go over to Cambridge, which is fine old city. And just as an example, looking at fine detail that's in these 3D models, this is um, King's College Chapel, um, where they have a famous carol service every year. And you can see the, the quality and fine detail that's in the 3D model there. If we just go across to the city's airport, uh, you can see uh, here we have a control tower. And what I've done is, is visualized a, or created a 3D view shed. Now, a view shed tells you in 3D what can be seen from a location and what can't. So everything that's green is visible from the viewpoint. Now, the viewpoint is on the front of the control tower there. So you can see the shadows that are created by objects that are visible. And for example, if they were going to build a new building out front of the, of the control tower, it would cast a shadow. So that's not very good. So you would want to sort of change that and modify that and put it in a position so the shadow it casts doesn't cover the runway or other area. So this is just really a representation of what you can do. Probably not exactly a real world one. But um, yeah. so if we now pop across to uh, Bristol, for example, Um, just to show you the sort of detail down in the docks here, we have the SS Great Britain, famous old um, first screw powered um, liner originally. And also just an example, there's a famous gorge here that the river runs through. We also can have a presentation, uh, which is a recording of points that the viewer is taken through as they fly. Oops, sorry. Well, there we go. Now, this presentation can also include other objects that appear and disappear at different times. It allows you to, to um, can or, or program in a series of events that you can then later fly through and, and view. We pop over to Oxford, another, another famous university city. Uh, again, looking at some of the, the old built buildings there that are visible, such as the Ratcliffe Camera, the famous library. And in contrast to the old city, in the suburbs there is a car factory. And if I just zoom in here, you will see it's the home of the Mini, where the Mini is built by BMW. So here we've got a big contrast in different types of, sort of geography that can be covered, an industrial scene or uh, the urban areas showing houses, trees, buildings and gardens. We pop down to Brighton. We have a combination here of an urban area, seaside area, we have a pier, but also, as Ita was talking about, uh, if you have rural areas where we have trees, golf courses, and the trees themselves are modeled, so you have a really nice 3D representation. Now, as it's a 3D data set, we can also run all kinds of analysis tools on it as well, just as we would for other types of data. So here, for example, I'm going to do a cross section across the road and the railway line. And you get the cross section. And if we click on this object here, it brings us to that. There is the railway line that's running in a cutting. 
if we click on here, this is the road, and there's a tiny little lump in the middle there, and that is the actual crash barrier in the central reserve. So it's quite a useful tool to be able to visualize in detail what the topography actually is of an area. So let's just shut that one down. And if we now go to London, in London, we've captured a couple of areas. Um, I will first show you this area here. There we go. Now this, this area is quite a long thin strip. It covers the city of London and also the Tower of London. We can have a quick look at that from the fly around. Uh, we also have flown another area of London that was flown a year previously, that's next door. And I've used this area to give you some sort of real examples of how we can do different types of analysis for um, radio planning or for communications planning. Um, I just open there. So, for example, we have two antennas, as I've set up, and they run between two buildings. Let's zoom out a bit. If you can see, there's a antenna here, antenna across there, it's about a kilometer apart. And we are able to, to model, um, for example, the, what was called the Fresnel zone. This is the sort of sausage shape um, volume that the signal will be occupy when it's transmitted between those two points. Now, why do we do that? Well, obviously, um, you don't want an interference or a structure that gets in the way, or we don't want it coming close to buildings. So you can actually come in here and see or not whether you have the clearance that you require. In addition, we can um, add in, for example, a new building. Somebody's going to extend the building. So we've popped in here a new extension to the building, and you can see it intersects with the Fresno zone, so that would not be you know, desirable. In addition, for sort of the uh, transmission um, part of the network, where it's transmitting signals through phones, we have antennas such as this one that we've placed here. Now they have an area surrounding them where the, the radiation is very high and you wouldn't want people in that area. So this green blob is a representation of that shape and you'd want to keep it clear of any area where a person could come in contact with it. So as you can see here, we're able to see that it clears the top of that building and we can easily move these shapes and put them in different positions and work out if they're going to be clear and good for everything else. Um, George showed you a little video of putting a new building in. Well, I'll explain now how we do that. For example, here we have a partly built uh, building. What we're going to do first is we're going to flatten it. So we've got a flat area. Now, the architect could give us the model of the completed building. We can insert that into the uh, model. So we have now the finished thing. I don't think the architect would pay very much for this building. It's pretty ugly. And we can also add a view shed in here as well. So this will tell us, for the guy who owns the, the, the apartment here, how will this new building affect his view? Well, the answer is it's going to affect his view pretty badly. He's not really going to have a great view out there anymore. Um, so that's really just a taster of all the different things that we can do. Now I see there's some questions here. Um, how can we merge two different 3D models seamless mosaic? Uh, well, providing they are um, tiled, then yes, you can just load them adjacent to each other. Um, if you wanted to, you can cut a 3D ML into a smaller piece, so you could actually cut the two 3D ML's so you have a seamless line between them. Um, are you able to classify LIDAR points in the photo, in the photo mesh? Well, I think actually the answer to that one is no, but on the subject of classification, I have one last thing I'd like to show you, and that is what we call a classified mesh, or rather a mesh which we've given attribution. If I come onto this mesh now and I, I hover the mouse over it, can you see each building is highlighted? If I click on it, you will see there is attribution for that building. In this case, 
the address of the building. Now, this can be very useful. So if you've got buildings of different age or attributions telling you who owns buildings, you can highlight it. And if we do things like switch off the unclassified areas, all we're left is, is the areas that actually have been classified. And if we go to properties and we've got tint on this, we can actually color it by a particular value. And each building gets a unique color based on the attribute that we're using to um, classify the mesh. I think for now, that's everything I've got. Um, Cathy, do you want to sort of pass this over to answer questions? Sure. So um, it looks like there are a couple questions um, in the question box. Uh, someone's asking, is this software open source? I think Itai addressed that question already. Yeah, this is a proprietary tool that is continuously developed by Skyline's development team. Um, and uh, we keep pushing uh, new technologies and new capabilities in um, pretty much uh, on the release cycle of at least two to three releases a year. It looks like a lot of the questions have been answered. Uh, Itai, do you see any that have not been? Um, no, I think I think uh, most of it has been addressed. Uh, the couple of things that you know I think are, are relevant to people. Um, you could approach George Day at Blue Sky or Dave Losher um, if there's any interest to evaluate either the technology, the software, or the data um, products. And uh, of course, if there's any interest in, in anything that is outside the UK, uh, you could approach the Skyline headquarters um, in the US and we could uh, relay you to uh, relevant offices worldwide, depending on where you are. Excellent. Well, if there are no other questions, thank you so much to Dave, George, and Itai for a fascinating webinar. And thank you all for joining us today. Please watch for an email containing links to this webinar and parts one and two of the series. That will be in your inbox within the next few hours. Don't forget to check out the case study. It's in the handout section before you go. Thanks again for spending a few minutes with us today and have a great day and a beautiful weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much.